I should start by saying happy Army 248th birthday uh, and uh, happy Flag Day, uh, both uh, both being celebrated today. But for most of us, uh, or I should say many of us in the audience, we're probably more attuned to the Army birthday than we are necessarily to Flag Day. Um, I'm Mike Perry. I'm uh, the host for the lecture series sponsored by the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center and the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The Heritage Center is the Army's premier repository for st the study of the history of the U.S. Army and its soldiers. The Heritage Center is also a component of the U.S. Army War College and located in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. Tonight's lecture is being sponsored by FN America, a producer of firearms for our military and for law enforcement activities. Tonight, I'm pleased to host uh, Eric Seishorn, who is a military historian and specializes in the history of the U.S. Army in Asia. After service in the U.S. Army and the intelligence community, he received his doctorate from George Washington University. He has published over two dozen academic articles with publications in such uh, journals as Parameters, Military Review, the Journal of American East Asian Relations, and the Journal of Military and Strategic Studies. Uh, his books, uh, tonight's book is his second, Arming East Asia, Deterring China in the Early Cold War. Uh, he previously uh, published a book called The Rise and Fall of an Officer Corps, The Republic of China's Military, 1942 to 1955. He is currently a federal employee and is also an adjunct faculty member at George Mason University and at the University of Maryland Global Con uh, Campus. We're pleased to have him tonight because uh, if you just watch the news, uh, his topic is one of significant, uh, as I say, relevance uh, to the world affairs today. So, Eric, the floor is now yours. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you fine. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the very kind introduction and the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, I've been a long time, I'm based in the D.C. area, so for many, many years I've been going up to Carlisle and I'm always tremendously impressed by the programs, the educational mission, the work that's going on there. And so I feel very privileged to contribute in my own small part to that endeavor. Um, very true what you noted in your introduction that we are engaged in a period, uh, this is the second year of the war in Ukraine, uh, the United States military, and in particular, I think the United States Army is working through sort of the, the world in which we live now of uh, return to great power competition. Uh, how can we deter uh, near peer competitors, whether they be uh, Russia, China, or Iran? How can we aid our allies? Uh, at the same time, and I think there's there's so many similarities between what we're going through now uh, and what Eisenhower faced in the 1950s. At the same time, we have a an American public, a Congress that is very skeptical of deploying large numbers of ground troops uh, outside the continental U.S. to fight. Uh, to fight in far-flung battlefields. And you know, after Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, that's what we see today. And in the 1950s, that was very true in Korea. Um, contributing to that similarity is the financial situation. Uh, the 1950s, there was a, a clear focus, uh, a feeling that military spending had to be reined in, had to be better controlled, uh, more bang for the buck, so to speak. And we, we think about the Eisenhower era, maybe the new look, the use of atomic weapons. But what I'm going to speak about tonight, the, the, what he called the mutual security program, which was a way to aid our allies, uh, aid our uh, countries that were on the front line, so to speak, particularly in East Asia, where all around China, you had a number of smaller countries which could be isolated, bullied by the People's Republic of China, uh, and they needed some sort of support because if the United States wasn't going to deploy large numbers of troops, large military forces, how could we, the United States strategically build a more sustainable, cost-effective, deterrent uh, solution to our problem? And that's really what I, I hope to draw out tonight. Um, a brief outline. Uh, after I spend a couple, I've got, plan to speak for about 40 minutes. Uh, I've got, I think, 14, 15 slides. After kind of uh, touching on what Eisenhower was really trying to do in East Asia, uh, which I, I think has similarities to today, I'd like to spend a fairly significant amount of time talking about Taiwan, which was uh, an excellent case study. Uh, Eisenhower was, you know, he, he was providing support through mutual security programs to Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, South Vietnam, 
Thailand, which I'll discuss in my book, but I really think Taiwan, for our perspective here in 2023, is perhaps the most relevant. And Taiwan was perhaps the, the best example of what the program could do uh, if fully funded, if fully supported. Uh, a couple slides I'd like to get into domestic responses, because one of the things that's very fascinating about providing military aid, military assistance, Oftentimes, it is very, very tricky domestically, uh, getting it through Congress, building public support. Uh, these are challenges when, in particular, opponents can point to it as, as wasteful foreign aid or giveaways. Uh, and that's something that has to be part of our understanding of the program. And lastly, I, I hope to leave about 20 minutes so that we can, I'm sure there's some expertise in the audience, some lessons learned, contemporary implications, uh, so that we can make this not just a... Uh, better understanding of history, but how in particular the U.S. Army can better shape the strategic picture for the United States. Uh, just to highlight there, you see on the slide, a standard disclaimer, uh, I'm no longer part of the U.S. Army, uh, nor do I work for DOD anymore. I do work for the federal government, so I do want to say that these views expressed are uh, my own personal views and do not represent the Department of Defense or the United States government. Uh, has to be said. So where do we start? Uh, I think the a good place to start is what motivates security policy. And in particular for the Army, uh, when Eisenhower came into office in January of 1953, he was faced with a, an ongoing conflict in Korea. Uh, and he had a very clear political need, an economic need, to do two things. Economically, cut military spending. Uh, military budgets were too high, they just weren't sustainable, and Eisenhower really saw that these are long-term issues, meaning the People's Republic of China, the Soviet Union, they're not going to go away in a couple years. We have to have spending that is sustainable for 5, 10, 20 years, maybe a generation or more. Uh, so that was something motivating his search for new strategies. The second was that political need to limit deployments. Deploying hundreds of thousands of troops was unpopular. Uh, that was not something that he wanted to have to explain to the American voters. Not something, you know, there was conscription during that period, but that's always a very quick way to gather opposition. So there's a, a strong motivation here to think of a better way, a more efficient way. Uh, and some of the, the thinkers got together in the National Security Council, and they were, it should be said, fairly optimistic. You see the quote there non-communist Asia, with the possible exception of Indochina, a big caveat I think we can all uh, agree knowing what later happened, can under conditions of continued Western assistance cope with the present level of Chinese communist and native communist pressures. So at the same time, there's a, a motivation to do something different. There is a sense that, well, there is a foundation in East Asia. We have allies, we have security partners, we have friendly governments. And if we find out a way to help them, perhaps that can be a way to resolve all our problems as well. And we see the, the cartoon here, um, Eisenhower kind of pointing towards, you know, East Asia rather than Europe as the new front line in the battlefield, that China was now the, the focus of a lot of his efforts. That was where really he was going to put a lot of his energy, a lot of his um, uh, efforts to revitalize American security strategy. Many of these ideas, it should be said, were formed before, shortly before he took office, when he went on a trip to Korea. Uh, we see the photo here. He's visiting Korea during the winter. It's very cold. He's getting a sense of the conditions on the front line. And he came away very impressed with, in particular, what U.S. Army uh, training programs had done with the Korean forces. Uh, the KMAG, the Korean Military Assistance Advisory Group, had trained South Koreans, equipped them integrated them into the UN command, not to the same level of capabilities as US Army units, um, but certainly this was a force that if it had a defensive force posture, it could hold the line, it could deter Chinese and North Korean attacks. Most of the focus was on a large army uh, rather than uh, an air force or navy. You saw had a few small uh, ships, some, some short range aircraft, but this was a way to sort of utilize local indigenous uh, personnel uh, fighting for their, their own country. Uh, they just needed some help. 
And this was something that really, I think, caught the attention of Eisenhower, something he hadn't counted on. And this would inform a lot of his thinking in the early 1950s as he was trying to figure out, again, a way to reduce costs, but still deter China, still maintain a security presence in East Asia. And this example that he'd seen in Korea was really the template, if you will, or sort of a broader program, which could then be expanded to Taiwan, to Japan, to the Philippines, to South Vietnam, to Thailand, and encircle in some ways China with friendly, capable, low-cost military forces. And that brings us to, I, I want to get in a little more detail on how this works, because particularly for the U.S. Army, uh, the U.S. Army was always the largest uh, contributor or personnel to these military assistance advisory groups. They always had the biggest interest in sort of providing a more robust security partner. And in Taiwan, the U.S. Army, especially in the period from 1953 to 57, Eisenhower's first term, uh, does uh, an exceptional amount of work and I think has a tremendous amount of implications. Uh, Taiwan, to start, fit in very well with the model Eisenhower had seen in Korea. Um, the Republic of China, that is the Taiwanese forces, they don't need to be asked to, you know, invade the PRC. They don't really need to be asked to deploy elsewhere. A clear, simple goal, you need to have a defensive posture that's credible, uh, that's sustainable, where you have perhaps a hardened infrastructure, uh, troop reserves, a simple fact that if you can deny Taiwan to the PRC, that's a big plus to the United States overall strategic picture. If you don't have to call on U.S. troops, that can be a tremendous asset. And some of this had already, the foundation had been laid during the Truman administration. Uh, after the North Korean invasion of South Korea, uh, a small mag had been set up, a Major General William Chase, a very kind of interesting figure, not really a traditional Army career track. He'd spent most of the 1930s in ROTC units. Uh, he'd later served in the Pacific under MacArthur. He's assigned to Taiwan in, in 51, uh, but he has a real problem sort of getting his requests filled uh, in Washington. It's sort of low priority. Uh, you know, Korea's going on. There are bigger things to worry about. But he does develop a very good relationship with the local commander, a man named Sun Lee Jun. Uh, who's an interesting figure as well, uh, a VMI graduate, had fought with Stilwell for most of the war in Burma. Uh, so he was very, very used to working with Americans. And the two of them uh, form a very close relationship. And I, I think that's a big, right off the bat, a big thing I'd like to highlight that uh, these military assistance advisory groups are really, they rise and fall in a lot of ways through close relationships by military officers, uh, seeing eye to eye, looking for ways to help each other, looking for a way to understand what are the concerns that are motivating their policies. And that's a, a real bedrock of success in Taiwan is this close relationship between these two officers. Once Eisenhower takes office, though, he's really putting a lot more emphasis into weapons transfers, into training programs, in very, very quickly. Uh, this sort of um, skeletal organization where you had um, personnel strength was below what was assigned, trouble getting replacements, trouble getting, you know, parts and equipment. All of a sudden that gets, those things get filled. Uh, the MAG is massively expanded. By 1955, you have over 3,000 Americans assigned to the military assistance group. So mostly officers, some senior NCOs. And they're trying to inculcate kind of this model that was developed in Korea, the simple mission, defend Taiwan from China, large, large scale arms transfers. We see a couple of photos there, an F-86, again, a short range interceptor, something that you can train Taiwanese pilots to operate fairly quickly and effectively. We see there on the bottom M24 tanks, a light tank, uh, not too taxing in terms of maintenance, spare parts, large amounts of World War II surplus were available. Uh, and so a, an army of over 500,000 troops was actually supported uh, in Taiwan. Uh, by 1955, you have, you know, half a million troops that, you know, they're not going to be able to deploy really anywhere, 
but they can hold defensive positions. U.S. officers are convinced that, you know, they know how to shoot, they know how to maneuver, they can handle artillery, they can handle airstrikes. There's a confidence that this can be a very credible deterrent force. And it fits into that economic model. Large Army, short-range aircraft, small Navy, this is something the U.S. can support. And the U.S. is supporting it in terms of not just with equipment, but in direct transfers of, of money, paying the, not directly, but paying the, uh, the bills, so to speak, for this military. Uh, Eisenhower was putting his money where his mouth is, so to speak, and spending large amounts for what he perceived to be a overall beneficial goal. Uh, you don't have to send U.S. troops to Taiwan if you have a capable, strong force equipped with good weapons, they can hold off the PRC uh, in any sort of invasion, and that will free up U.S. assets to be used elsewhere. One of the real highlights, though, and I think this is sometimes overlooked in a lot of the scholarship, and I really was fascinated by this, is that the U.S. Army spends a lot of time, not just in Taiwan, but other areas of East Asia, on military education. Uh, so often we hear about military training, uh, you know, teaching a soldier to drive a truck or a tank or uh, qualify with an assigned weapon. But the overwhelming majority of U.S. personnel, in Taiwan at least, are not assigned to units as liaison personnel. They're assigned to schools. Uh, that is, we see a photo here on the, the top and the, the bottom, particularly schools for officers. One of the things about mutual security, uh, particularly during the Eisenhower area, is that it was the Cold War was perceived to be, it's going to go on for a long time. We can't just train a soldier who in two years is going to, you know, they're going to be a civilian again. We have to establish a military in our partner, in our allied nations that can continue to refine itself, that continue to pass along um, evolving knowledge, continue to advance and be a good ally. And so a huge network of schools, um, Especially, uh, I would point out for, for senior officers, this is something that I think is uh, um, maybe a little bit uh, interesting because, you know, senior officers, they've already had maybe 10, 15, 20 years in the military. Uh, but it was perceived from the U.S. perspective, it's not just skills. These senior officers really need to understand where the U.S. is coming from, uh, the U.S. sort of overall strategic approach. Uh, the strategy, how does the U.S. political system work, uh, so that if there's ever a crisis, senior officers will be better able to coordinate. And so that if there's policy issues, uh, senior officers would kind of know where the U.S. is coming from. So again, building a more enduring relationship, it's important, the MAG thought, the military assistance advisory personnel thought, to include these senior officers because they will be kind of these uh, intermediaries. Um, and last but not least, it should be said that uh, programs in East Asia, like elsewhere in the world, are only one component of this. Uh, thousands of officers throughout the 1950s, not just from Taiwan, but from uh, Korea, from South Vietnam, from Turkey, from other places, are also brought to study in the United States, um, partially for those skills. But again, part of that is cultural, to help them better understand who the United States is, especially how the United States Army operates, sort of what its sort of uh, uh, thinking process is. And going to places like CGSC or branch schools is a great way to transfer that knowledge. It should be said, this is not a, uh, I feel like the last three slides or so I've been talking about, you know, how fairly straightforward or effective this is. One of the, the challenges um, the United States faces when we, we want to help out allies, we want to help out partners, is oftentimes they have very different political systems. They have very different uh, cultural systems. And this was absolutely true in Taiwan. Uh, the, the photo there, the man seated, that's Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, if you've read about anything, uh, your World War II history, Chiang Kai-shek had a very tumultuous relationship with the U.S. military. Uh, after losing to the communists in 1949, he's fled to Taiwan, and he's really the, the supreme leader, but he's given a lot of roles to his son, who's the gentleman standing. 
And one of the challenges that U.S. officers faced in Taiwan is that uh, there was a, a, a role in the military there referred to as political officers. And a lot of this goes all the way back to the 1920s when Chiang Kai-shek had wanted to maintain loyalty, uh, but particularly after the defeat uh, by the, the communists and the, the flight to Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek and his son are very, very concerned about military officers being loyal to the regime. And you know this is not really a democracy and uh, they wanna continue their rule for as long as they can. And so these political officers are part of the Taiwanese military structure, and they report to Chiang ching uh, the son. And this is a, an immense problem uh, throughout the 1950s. There's really no solution to it, but American advisor after American advisor says, we train, we educate, we provide weapons, uh, but always there's that guy in the back of the room. Uh, what is he doing? Well, he's reporting on what's going on to his chain of command. Personnel decisions are sometimes made not on the basis of sort of transparent information, not on the basis of who might be the most effective commander. Sometimes it's a political desire to appoint people who are loyal to the Chiang family. And in a particularly noteworthy case, that great partner, uh, Sun Li Jun, a VMI graduate, fought with Stillwell, great friend of the Americans, sort of saw eye to eye. Uh, many Americans said, you know, he was the person we could get things done with. We could do business with him. Uh, he's arrested midway through the 50s on sort of a, a trumped up charge that one of his aides uh, was conspiring against the government. Uh, and he's put under, under house arrest. So this is always a very difficult dilemma with any military advising program. Um, there are political, I mean, it should be said, uh, compromises sometimes that have to be made. In the case of Taiwan, it doesn't help that there was often a division. Uh, the U.S. Army, for example, was like, we have to pressure the heck out of the government to get rid of these officers. They're, they're trouble. Uh, they're always going to be a problem. On the other hand, the U.S. State Department is saying, don't rock the boat, don't cause problems. Uh, we're in their country. Uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, so to speak. Uh, and so that's a, an enduring, I, I, I think, tension um, where you know, the best plans can, can sometimes, at the local level, these things are much more complicated. Uh, it looks great to have a spreadsheet or a PowerPoint slide in Washington, D.C. or Taipei, uh, but at the unit level, sometimes there's these local complications uh, that can really cause some friction between the U.S. and partners. Let me give you a, a small example, though, of that friction aside. I think by the end of the 50s, Eisenhower's goals had really been achieved in a lot of ways. Uh, U.S. troops, except for the advisory group, uh, were not regularly deployed to Taiwan. So it wasn't putting a burden on the U.S. Army. Um, Taiwan, really, there was a, a series of crises during the 1950s, all, one of which I'll talk about now. Uh, but there really was a sense that Taiwan could defend itself. The best example being in 1958, uh, the second Taiwan Straits crisis. Uh, there was one in 55, one second in 58. There has been more since then. Uh, knock on wood, we don't have any more, but no one can predict the future. In 1958, uh, the People's Republic of China has started shelling Kui Moi. And I've got that circled on the, in the red there. Kui Moi, uh, now known as Kinmen, uh, same place, just different uh, transliteration of the names. A small island kind of right off the Chinese mainland. Um, it was being shelled by thousands of rounds per day. Uh, the idea being that the PRC was um, either going to attack or cause a lot of casualties. Either one could be a real test of the U.S. commitment to Taiwan. But uh, the military was well prepared. Uh, there were over 70,000 troops on Kui Moi. Uh, they had hardened facilities. They were well motivated. They were well trained. They had plenty of equipment, ammunition. And so this bombardment begins and goes on for, for weeks. Uh, thousands of rounds raining down on the island. Chiang Kai-shek, uh, again, it's always a little bit difficult sometimes working with allies. 
he senses this is an opportunity uh, to attack perhaps China and is arguing for a more strong American response. But another key thing that I, I think I was struck by in doing my research, MAG officers, they're not just helping our allies, they're providing information back to decision makers, whether that be Pacific Command, whether that be in Washington. So one of the fascinating things is that while Chiang Kai-shek is screaming for help, the MAG officers on Kim Men are saying, we're fine. Uh, the truce morale is good. We've got plenty of ammo. Uh, yeah, if this goes on for another couple of weeks or maybe months, we might need reinforcements, but we're holding. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And throughout this crisis, with that sort of uh, thumbs up, if you will, from the MAG, the only unit that is actually deployed to Taipei is a air defense unit, a battalion of Nike Hercules missiles. So, I mean, if you think a major crisis situation and the only response is a uh, an aircraft battalion. I mean, that gives decision makers a lot of leeway. Uh, that gives them a lot of um, options, so to speak. It takes some of the pressure off, uh, particularly the army, to deploy uh, at short notice across the vast distances of the Pacific. So in this case, I, I think we can see that the, the investment that Eisenhower and others had made uh, in forces like the on Taiwan and South Korea in Japan and elsewhere, they could have a very decisive effect, a, a beneficial effect for the U.S. ability to manage uh, China, to deter China, to say, hey, we have a, an ally here which is ready to go, which is prepared. Uh, don't, don't try anything further. So by the 60s, you really have a sort of consensus that you know, Taiwan's military, it's not a... Uh, you know, not a first-class military, it's not up to levels of the U.S. or maybe the U.K. or Canada, but it's pretty good, and it can get the job done. That is, the United States does not need to worry so much, oh, will the PRC be able to do a sneak attack and take over Taiwan? Uh, will the PRC be able to bully or threaten Taiwan? Uh, no. The feeling is that Taiwan's military is robust, it's sustainable, uh, it has well-trained troops. It has well-educated officers. And this is something they can, within limits, uh, hold their own. And one of the, the points made in the 1950s, Admiral Radford, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs early in Eisenhower's term, he has this wonderful concept. Uh, he talks about a lot with Congress. You know, we're, He says, we're looking for strategic bargains. If the United States, we can't have a huge military due to the cost, and we can't deploy it all over the world because that would be uh, politically unsustainable at home. He says we have to look for strategic bargains, right? Kind of like your, your bargain shopping at the supermarket. And in Taiwan, we see for a, a soldier, it cost $225 US in the 1950s, that is, uh, to support them. The, to deploy an American soldier to Taiwan in the 1950s was $3,500. So not only is the Taiwan military um, good enough, so to speak, but it has accomplished that objective of being a strategic bargain. The United States military is not going to bankrupt itself uh, to support this force, and it's getting a lot of return for that investment. And it should be said that uh, one of the most positive things the Eisenhower administration saw was this is a relationship that we've now built. And that's particular, I think, to the Army. Uh, armies work together closely, uh, you know, they're shoulder to shoulder, uh, there are large numbers of personnel, and that the relationship built during the 50s, in a lot of ways, continues to the present day. We see here a photo of Apache helicopters. Uh, the military in Taiwan, you know, they fly Apaches, they fly Blackhawks, they buy Patriot missiles. There is a sense that really since the 1950s, Taiwan has been aligned with the U.S. Uh, their force structure has been very similar to the U.S. Um, their sort of ethos in a lot of ways has been similar to the U.S. And yes, there have been some political changes, the democratization of Taiwan, but that security relationship has been enduring. And that's a, a key part of sort of what Eisenhower saw as mutual security. We're going to keep our allies, build relationships, build connections that are going to be perpetuated 5, 10, 20, 30 years into the future. And that's certainly, I think, uh, been borne out in a lot of cases, not just Taiwan, 
South Korea, Japan, Thailand as well. Here's a couple of quotes. And I, I selected these quotes because I, I really like the, um, the fact that the administration, the Eisenhower administration, and this is something they brought to strategy, was a very sort of dispassionate, uh, clinical, a, a lot of budgetary terms, which I think gives you a good sense of how they thought about strategy, how they thought about the army. We see here the ambassador in Taiwan, Carl Rankin, the outlay for American taxpayers, well, less than that, uh, what it would have cost to maintain in the Western Pacific an equivalent counterweight and deterrent to communist aggression in the United States forces, right? So this idea of we're looking for the low cost option. And if it costs less for the same product, that's the one we need to go to. Uh, a quote from Admiral Radford on the bottom, by cooperation with our allies, we obtain a better defense at lower cost to ourselves than if we try to do the job ourselves, right? This idea that, uh, again, if we can find a better, more effective solution at lower cost, that's the one we should go with. And that was part of the, the goal they were trying to achieve in a period when budgets were very, very tight. Here's a, uh, a, a chart uh, with the, I, I just wanna highlight, you know, just how stark Eisenhower's uh, pivot or rebalance, or I, I forget all the buzzwords that we've been using in the past decade for shifting to Asia. Um, the blue here is military aid that was going to Europe. So you see during the Truman administration, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly going to Europe. Very, very small amounts going to East Asia. But look at by 57. This has really been almost reversed, that Eisenhower um, has really put the, the focus of military aid on East Asia. He saw you know, Europe, we made some investments, but it's fairly stable. But China, China is a challenging peer competitor. China is surrounded by small, vulnerable countries. And he saw this is where we have to make our investments. This is where we have to put our, our, our weapons and our money into this region, because that's where it can make a difference for American security strategy. So uh, a, a great reverse there. And I, I wanted, one of the things I wanted to highlight in this book was that I, I think Eisenhower doesn't get enough uh, credit perhaps for being so farsighted and recognizing how Asia would be so important to the, the future American security strategy, uh, our future allies, how important they'd be economically. And he put a huge amount of investment into making sure that that happened. By 57, I, here's a, just a crude graphic, if you will, just to show you the, the scope of this program, uh, how much the United States was getting in terms of security. Uh, Taiwan, the US was essentially paying for 21 divisions, South Korea, 20, Japan, six, Philippines, two, Thailand, two, South Vietnam, 10. Uh, and this was all worked out in the 1950s. Uh, the budget analysts were very sharp at the time. And, you know, what is the equivalent to this? So look at that's That's well, what is that? Maybe almost 60 divisions, 61 divisions, if I'm doing my math right, for the cost equivalent to seven U.S. Army divisions. Uh, yes, I mean, you can say U.S. Army divisions might be much more capable. Uh, on the other hand, you might say U.S. Army divisions, they'd be operating far from the United States. We're supporting our allies so that they can field disproportionately large forces, their own indigenous personnel, uh, so that they can deter China on their own. And we don't have to send U.S. Army forces across the Pacific. One, one caveat here, though, I, I just want to, uh, an interesting wrinkle that I, I think was really true throughout the 1950s. While Many senior leaders thought that mutual security, as it was broadly called, this program of military aid, military advising, they thought it really helped them achieve their goals. The biggest problem in some ways was not China, uh, was not facts on the ground, if you will, uh, Congress. Military aid, there was an initial honeymoon period. When Eisenhower first came into office, uh, the Korean War was still a hot war. There was a feeling, well, if that's what we have to pay for security, he's Eisenhower, he's a former four-star general, 
we respect his judgment. Uh, we trust him to make these investments. But very quickly, really as early as 54, you're starting to see more and more people in Congress say, why are we giving so much money to these countries? Uh, what sort of you know processes do we have to see how this spending is being used? And one of the early ways to slander this program, and it drove Eisenhower crazy, was to call it foreign aid. Uh, this idea that you're giving away money for this sort of uh, broad, you know, whether it's economic or cultural or social needs. Uh, many in Congress would say, oh, you call it mutual security. You call it, you know, we're aiding the, the armies in Taiwan or South Korea, but really it's foreign aid. And that just drove Eisenhower nuts. He'd say, we're making an investment in military power. We're making a strategic investment in our allies. This is not foreign aid. This is a targeted, uh, direct um, program to improve capabilities. Uh, but nonetheless, that foreign aid, uh, just mentioning that word, is, is so loaded. And that was uh, used by many opponents in Congress. And all throughout, really, the period from 55 to 60, you have this back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it should be said, you know, Sometimes the executive in Congress, they, uh, you know, Congress isn't always swayed by um, what many might think of as logical arguments. They're trying to get elected in the next two years. They want to make a point for their constituents. Why are we sending this money abroad? You know, nation building begins at home. You know, billions to send to South Korea or Taiwan. And why doesn't my district get anything? So there are often very political reasons for congressional opposition. The administration sometimes doesn't help its case, though. Uh, Eisenhower is a very low, how shall I say, faith in Congress. Uh, so many of these military aid programs, they're deliberately confusing. Uh, dollars will be moved from one, one program to another, back and forth, very, um, very often between budget years, so that if you're a congressional sort of analyst, it's very hard to see exactly where the money is going. And that was, in, in a lot of ways, deliberate, right? Confuse Congress. Obstruct. Uh, many of these programs, even if you're delivering, you know, boots or old surplus World War II tanks, they were marked as, you know, highly classified. Or, oh, you know, we can't let you know the details to that until 24 hours before the vote. Uh, and, and many in Congress said, you know, the administration is really not playing fair with this. They're expecting us to vote on very, very large dollar amounts, and they're not allowing us to do due diligence. Um, you know, say, where is this money going? What sort of, uh, you know, ways do we have to check that it's being spent properly? Is there corruption? Is there malfeasance, fraud? Uh, and so there's, you know, a lack of faith on both sides. Eisenhower tries to get together blue ribbon commissions. Many of uh, former generals in particular, uh, like James Van Fleet, other senior leaders, uh, you know, they tour East Asia, they come back and almost in a lecturing tone say to Congress, we have to give them, you know, F-86 fighters. We have to give them M-48 tanks. We have to provide these weapons. That's what they need. Uh, but it's often from a point of, you know, oh, Congress, can you just just give us the money, right? We don't really want to engage you. It's more of a, almost a, a pedantic sort of lecturing demeanor. And so there's a real, I, I think, by the end of the Eisenhower administration, this program, which many within the government, the executive branch felt had been successful, been effective, had significantly improved the U.S. position, had taken the pressure off of the United States Army. Uh, but many in Congress said, no, we're, we're not going to, do much of this going forward. It was just too much of a hassle and we've lost faith in the executive branch to execute it. So there is a uh, maybe a an overall very successful picture, uh, one maybe domestic problem that emerges from that by this sort of lack of faith, I, which I think in some ways has characterized military aid up till today. Uh, a feeling that sometimes military aid is not being spent appropriately, uh, large amounts of money, uh, from not much return uh, by those in Congress. And I think we certainly see that with contemporary issues. So in conclusion, uh, before I uh, you know, um, open up the questions, I'd just like to make three points, which I think 
um, my case study of Taiwan, I, I think hits the, the positives and negatives. Um, the U.S. Army plays a critical role to deterring Chinese aggression, um, not just its presence, uh, but by supporting, but by allowing our allies to be more effective. And this can take uh, you know, the role of weapons transfers, of proven U.S. equipment, educating, uh, better aligning our allies with sort of a U.S. strategic posture. And all of those things are, uh, I think, the Army, more so than the, the Navy and Air Force, plays a role in being there and helping our allies. The second is that military connections are incredibly valuable politically to show commitment and to show trust. Uh, the point was not lost uh, in East Asia. If you had a large group of army advisors in Taiwan, in South Vietnam, in South Korea, in Thailand, there's a feeling, well, that country now has a firm relationship with the United States, and it will probably be even stronger in the future. So in a sort of political sense, uh, it's a powerful signaling device uh, for um, military aid, military advising to build trust with partners. And, and lastly, I would say that, you know, the examples I, I looked at in my book uh, were mostly, we might think of them as building forces in peacetime. The South Vietnam, of course, has its own issues going on during the 1950s. But uh, I, I think perhaps there's been some dismissiveness of the U.S. Army's ability to assist allies in light of events in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, certainly, you know, there's always issues. Uh, but I, I do think that the 1950s overall, by 1961, when Eisenhower leaves office, the South Korean military is capable and effective. Taiwan's military is capable and effective. Japan is coming along. South Vietnam is probably in better position than it would have been without these programs. So that there are, uh, there is, I think, a lot of value. Uh, and the U.S. Army has a, a decent track record. Obviously, building forces during wartime is much more difficult, much more challenging. But in East Asia, uh, I think there was a pretty good uh, record of success. And the U.S. Army has a lot that it can, that can take credit for uh, during this period. Three challenges, though, and I, I have a feeling there might be some people uh, in the audience who have served in the military. Uh, so I, I meant these to be kind of a lead into some questions. Um, Military culture is an issue. One of the factors that perhaps after 1960 means this military assistance program loses steam is that it's not very popular if you're an officer in the U.S. Army to go be a military advisor in Taiwan, in South Korea, in Japan. It's much more attractive to be uh, a battalion commander. That's the way to get brigade command. So if you're the critical ranks for a lot of these advisory programs are majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels. Um, oftentimes, it's a tough sell to get folks in the U.S. military out of their career track to go serve as advisors, where they could do a heck of a lot of good, um, but that might hurt their career uh, back in the real army, so to speak. So that's something that I, I, I have been really intrigued by since I wrote the book, trying to learn more about this. The second one, uh, bureaucracy, and I, I think we can maybe look at events, um, you know, contemporary events. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to get it through all the levels of bureaucracy, particularly in Washington, D.C., uh, whether you're, you know, supplying a, a weapon or supplying a radio. How many approvals do you need? How many, um, how much support do you need from different organizations? Eisenhower was very, very good at pushing things through the system. Um, if in other conflicts, sometimes those things get bogged down. And I mean, we see debates in the current world with, with Ukraine, right? Uh, do they need, does Ukraine need, you know, HIMARS? Does it need ATACMS? Well, do you want to do a six-month study of it, or do you just want to push it out there? Um, bureaucracy has a purpose. Uh, but at the same time, that, that bureaucracy can also slow things down uh, quite a bit. And lastly, uh, there's no perfect solution that the military advisory program in East Asia, just like I think we might see the military advisory program in the world today, it's always evolving. Uh, you know, it could be you start off with Javelin missiles, then you go to HIMARS, then Patriots, then ATACMS. There's always a progression. And that throughout the 1950s, military advisors in Taiwan, for example, were always on the lookout 
what we did yesterday, that's not going to be the way battles are fought tomorrow. We can't just let this program kind of coast. Military advisory efforts uh, have to always evolve, which takes work, which takes motivation, takes energy. And I think sometimes they can be, um, well, we're green on this slide, so to speak, right? In the Army lingo, if the slide is green, that means it's good. Well, it might be green, but we still have to be continually changing, adapting. Uh, what worked in the past needs to be refined uh, for the future. And I think I'll, I'll leave it on that point. Um, I believe that is my last slide. Uh, so uh, thank you for um, uh, attending. I, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Eric, if you want to go ahead and close your slides. Okay, let me back up to. I'm stop sharing. Yep, stop sharing. Whoops. Uh, if anyone has questions, please use the question and answer icon at the bottom of your or top of your screen to submit your questions, and that'll pass them on over to Eric. I'll, I'll ask the first question. We mm -hmm. talk about uh, equipment being sent in the mid '50s from the U.S. to uh, to Taiwan. What was the qualitative difference between the armed forces of uh, People's Republic of China and Taiwan at that time? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so. At that time, the, the PRC is going through a major refit with a lot of Russian equipment. This is the period when, you, you know, if you look at a lot of the photos when the communists actually took power in 1949, they're using a lot of U.S. stuff. <laughs> they're using, you know, they're riding in U.S. trucks. They're using all this equipment they captured from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists. Uh, but they're re being re-equipped during the 1950s with Soviet material, whether that be MiG-15s, AK-47s, very good artillery. Uh, that's something that happened during the time of the race crisis. It was like, wow, they got some really good artillery and a lot of it really surprised Americans. Um, that is a challenge for the U.S. military advisors on Taiwan because one of the, talking about that evolving aspect, the initial thought was, well, you know, Taiwanese, they've got these 105 millimeter howitzers. They've got F-86s. You know, they've got M-24 tanks. That's pretty good, right? And it, by the late 50s, it's like, no, you, you always have to stay on top. You can't just hand off a bunch of stuff and you're, you're done. Uh, so by the late 50s, you're seeing eight-inch howitzers are being given to the Taiwanese, uh, new jet fighters, uh, air -air, anti-aircraft missiles rather than artillery. Uh, so to achieve that parity. So that's, that's part of the uh, why it takes so much work is the Chinese are always updating Therefore, the United States on the on the periphery, whether it be South Korea, Taiwan, South Vietnam, they've always got to have you know good intelligence to see what's going on, and then react with improved, more effective weapons. So, a delicate balancing act, very delicate. Uh, you didn't talk about the, uh, the. I don't think much about the shelling of. Uh, I can't pronounce Quimo and Mat. Uh, yeah. What effect did that have on U.S. policy? Not a, not a whole lot. I, I think, you know, the U.S. policy, it's one of these crises that um, it, it's still to this day unclear, you know, was Mao trying to provoke a stronger U.S. response? Um, but the U.S., I think, rides it out pretty smoothly. We deploy just one battalion of army forces. There are some more significant air or naval deployments. But of course, you know, it's a heck of a lot easier to deploy air and naval forces. Um, but really, you know, the Taiwanese military forces sound, South Korea sound. I mean, if you look throughout the region in 1958, there's cause for concern, uh, but not alarm. And, and I think that provides policymakers with a lot of um, leeway to handle a crisis. When you, you know, you don't have to, you know, work for two days straight to find out a solution. You can let the situation develop. Uh, and so I think that that crisis really shows investing in these forces that's going to help you when the rubber meets the road, so to speak, in these crisis situations. Um, we have uh, from uh, someone who wished to be, uh, remain unknown. Sure. He comments, today we are reliant, reliant on both China and Taiwan for many critical technologies and products. And today China is reaching or at parity with the U.S. in nu uh, numerous military areas. This seems to change the calculus on how we act with allies and how we continue to deter, uh, deter China. 
Uh, that's a comment. I'm not sure if your current federal position would allow you to respond <laughs> to that, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a chance if you wish. Um, I, I did write a, uh, gosh, it's probably a little dated, but about three years ago, I wrote a, an article from Military Review, which is the CGSC's journal. So that I was probably much more eloquent in that article um, uh, talking about Taiwan. Uh, certainly, yes, in, in 1955, uh, the United States had such a, a bigger leeway in terms of the military we had in the world. Um, but it should be said, in 1955, the United States Army, for example, was also pretty worried about places like Germany, places were pretty worried about, you know, Turkey. Um, now, I think, you know, one of the, one of the aspects of, of East Asia is that, uh, um, we have a lot of capabilities that, you know, we're not talking about deploying forces to other regions. Uh, so we do have some flexibility. Uh, and it should be said, um, we're in a better position because of, look at our allies in East Asia. South Korea in 1955 was poor, undeveloped, you know, recruits were conscripted. They didn't have really any education. Now we're talking about some of the most developed places in the world. Uh, tech savvy, um, and it's places like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan are all on our side. So, yes, there's there's pros and cons of the development of East Asia, but I still think we're in a pretty strong position uh, regarding the balance of power with our allies. We have, we have no other questions, which surprises me. But I'd ask you, do you have any comments in closing? Yeah, sure. I I fully understand these some of these topics, which are. Uh, there's not really a specific battle or a famous general that I can point to, uh, but I, I part of the reason I, I just I love this topic because you know the the army evolves, the army adapts, and it adapts to fit to fit the security situation of the United States. And there are many many tools that we can draw from, uh, whether we're looking at right now in Ukraine or or East Asia. And I, I think the army in the past did a pretty good job of helping our partners and being relevant. And I, I think, especially when the budgets are tight, uh, policymakers are saying, you know, what can the army do for U.S. national security? I think the army can do a lot. And I think the army did a lot in the 50s. And I, I think has continued that on to the present day. And uh, those connections, those um, uh, building of trust, the relationships, uh, continues, I, I think, to be a, a massive support to American national security. Well, I want to thank, want to thank you for a, an engaging talk tonight, and I think it is relevant. Uh, small audience, uh, I'm learning that summertime is not good. Yeah. Uh, um, I'd ask those that are in the audience, uh, please uh, let your friends know that we'll be posting this up on the Foundation's YouTube site here in the next day or so. Uh, we'll also be emailing, blasting out the, the links to others. So please uh, let others know about this talk because I think it is very relevant uh, to the concerns we're facing at this time. Uh, our next talk is on July 12th at 7 p.m. We're going to move up uh, a decade or two uh, later than what we talked about today. Uh, and it's a slightly different talk. It's, uh, the, uh, the talk is called A Dove Amongst Eagles. Uh, with Linda Patterson and Colonel Frank Hancock. Uh, Linda Patterson's adopted her, his brother's, her brother's battalion. Her brother was killed in Vietnam, and she felt a responsibility to reach out to the soldiers that her brother served with and ad really adopted the battalion. And then during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, she continued her work with the same battalion. And that was when Frank Hancock was the commander of that battalion. So on July 12th uh, at, at 7 p.m., we'll be looking at really a uh, one woman's efforts to make sure our soldiers were taken care of. So I, I'll add, ask you to come back on, on July 12th. Again, Eric, look forward to what you coming up this way. Let me know. Uh, even though I'm not full-time anymore, I'll take you out to lunch. Pleasure. Been, been great to be here with you. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks. Good night. Have a good night.